works so that we actually approach it from a biblical perspective rather than all the ways you've been trained to think about work by your universities, by your families, and by our culture, right? Uh, for many of us, we grew up in cultures where you work in order to provide for your family and for future generations so they can do the exact same thing you did, just a little better, a little more comfortable, and a little more elite. For some of you, you've thought about work as, this is how I prove my identity, my worth, and I'm acquiring knowledge, skill, ability, so that I can maximize my contribution and um, fully express who I am. And for your employers, obviously, you're there as um, production units. I mean, they love you, they want to invest in you, I'm sure, but in the end, you're there to produce. And obviously, for the university that trained us, you are potential alumni givers. How does God think about work? I want to quickly look at the, how work is introduced into the human story and then give you three models of how we might think about work through Scripture. So if you have your Bibles, uh, or if you carry a phone and have an app, uh, I'm so old I still read a Bible, the paper. Uh, look with me at Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 um, begins this way. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And then as you know from the story, if you grew up in a kind of churchy crowd, or if you did, and God starts to create the universe. He separates out three great environments. Light from dark, the things above from things below, and the water from the land. And then over the next few days, he begins to fill those environments with things. And then... On the sixth day, you pick up the story again in verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock, and over all wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful. Increase in number. Fill the earth, subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves over the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Why does work matter? I want to suggest that this short passage, particularly in verses 26 through 28, gives us three reasons that work matters to us. One, we're created in the image of a God who works. We're created in the image of a God who works because the Third thing you know about God from this account in Genesis, right? The first thing that you know is he exists. In the beginning, God, right? You know that he exists. The second thing that you know is he speaks, right? And then the third thing you know is that he makes things. He creates the heavens and earth. Or depending on the order of how you're reading it, maybe it's the second thing you know. God exists and God works. And we're created in his image, God is revealed as an almighty worker who creates, molds, plans, designs, implements. He's a worker. And I think for those of us who have jobs, who are working in any field of human endeavor, part of the reason we work is because when we work, we are following what it means to be made in God's image. Some people say God's image is rationality and thought, but I don't think it's that. I think it's we represent God to his creation as his image bearers. And part of that means how well do we reflect what God is like? Why does it matter that God works? If you're an architect or an engineer, any architects or engineers here? Okay, there's one. Awesome. Two. Right? Think every time you construct something, every time you build or design something, you're literally doing the very thing that God did when he um, created the world. You have an opportunity to create with him. Right? If any of you work in um, finance, uh, law, those kind of fields, anybody? A couple of you, right? What does it mean to steward the creation that God has made? What does it mean to help people take the raw materials of creation and begin to design and to build? Do any of you work in the helping professions, medicine, uh, education, law, um, social work, things like that, right? What does it mean to care for the people that God made in his image, doing his work? What do the rest of you do? Over there in the middle. Throw out a couple um, careers. Sales? Okay, right. That's commerce, other things? Marketing, human resources, right? All of these things are unlocking the potential of the world that God has made. 
We work in part because we're created in the image of a God who works. It gives us dignity and meaning. This is why long-term, non-chosen unemployment is so devastating to people. It's not just economically devastating. It's emotionally and socially and spiritually devastating because we were created to work. Work matters um, because not only do we image God who works, we were created to work, right? What does God say to human beings? They say, just hang out. Frolic. Play no. What he actually says is this, right? Let us make humankind, let mankind in our image, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, over the livestock, and over all wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And then when he creates them, he says, I'm blessing you. Do these things. Right? Our purpose is to subdue the earth, to rule over its creatures, to help develop the inherent potential in the things that God made. He creates a garden for them, and he says, look, I gave you a little garden to begin to work in. The rest of the world is yours to fill. I'm giving you the idea of what creation could be like if you chose to put your arm to it, put your mind behind it, and your will toward it. Make it something more delightful and better than it started with. There's a story... um, where a pastor is talking to a farmer and they're looking all around over the acres and acres of crops and it's beautiful orchards and rows of crops, geometric patches in varying shades of green. And the pastor, of course, being a pastor, is kind of rhapsodizing, oh, look, God's so wonderful. How beautiful are the works of his hands. The farmer kind of looked at him, a little confused, and he said, well, I'm sure you're right, pastor, but you should have seen this place when God had it all to himself before I got my hands on it. Right? I think God delights when we take what he made and we go, here's how we're going to develop it. Here's how, as people made in the image of a creating God, we're going to create with the raw materials that you embedded in creation. One of the spiritual disciplines um, I adopted when I moved to New York City, but I do hear often in Chicago, is um, I take time to look at the city and its skyline, um, its architecture, I'm an architecture buff, it's cultural institutions, it's schools and it's cities, and I think a little bit about Psalm um, 8, right? O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You've set your glory in the heavens. Um, And then it says, uh, what is mankind that you're mindful and human beings that you care for them? You've made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the work of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and animals of the wild, birds of the sky, fish in the sea that swim in the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And often we think about, I think as urban people, we do that in creation. You go to the Grand Canyon or you go to the ocean and you just go, the Lord has made beauty. I turn my eye to the skyline of Chicago and its neighborhoods and I think, Lord, what amazing things you've allowed human beings to create in your name, and for your glory. We find um, we were created to work. The other thing that Genesis tells us is that work matters because we're created in God's image. We're created to work. Work matters in part because it's part of God's blessing to us. Did you notice after he creates them, right? He says, it says in verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, which is a lot more than just have sex and have children. Right? It's actually cultivate the world around you. Fill the earth and subdue it. Change it and nurture it. Rule over the fish of the sea and birds of the sky and over every living creature that moves over the ground. I want to suggest that the blessing of work manifests in a couple of different ways. One of which is immediately before verse 28. In verse 27, it talks about the creation of humanity as both male and female in perfect partnership, working together to subdue the earth. Part of the blessing of the work is the ability and the opportunity to work with other people. In particular, I think it's best unlocked when men and women work together in partnership as equals accomplishing the task that God called them to. If you look at the creation account in Genesis 2, it talks about the woman being created as a helper. And I think in our English terminology, helper has this kind of um, negative terminology, like when my kids try to help me, they're my little helper. And you just think it's going to take twice as long, but I'm so glad you're helping. But In the context of the Hebrew Bible, when the word helper is used, 75% of the times it's used, it's used of God. God is my help and my strength. 
right? God is my help and my shield. It's used other times as a military ally. Israel would look for help from Egypt, a stronger military ally against the Assyrians or Babylonians. When scripture uses the word help, it means the one who has everything I do not have. The one who is strong when I am weak, the one who is wise when I am foolish, the one who um, is careful when I am foolhardy. Um, that is the one who is my help. And when God brings Adam and Eve together, he says, I'm going to give you the perfect help you need. So that you have the perfect partner, equivalent in dignity, majesty, and authority to till the earth and to change the world. Because you, man, do not have it all. You need woman to make it a perfect pair. And part of what God says, I made them male and female, and now I'm going to bless you by calling you to this work together. And in a Me Too Church Too age, where men often are like, ah, I don't know what to, how best to partner with women, I want to suggest that part of the beauty of work is unlocking the potential of what it means for men and women to work together. Part of the blessing of work, I want to suggest, is um, it allows us to extend God's reign and rule in concrete ways because embedded in the idea of being made in God's image is this. Um, in ancient Near Eastern times, what kings would do would be to send their... Um, when they would conquer a country, they would um, build an idol of themselves, right? They'd build a statue of themselves to say, in this place I reign. Um, and wherever you saw a statue of the king, you would know this was part of the Babylonian Empire, this was part of the um, Egyptian Empire. We don't do that as much here any longer, right? When the U.S. conquers things, we don't build um, statues of our generals. But what we do do is send this kind of image of ourselves into other places, right? And so you know wherever this is accepted, the U.S. has some authority, reign, and rule. And what God actually seems to say by creating us in his image is wherever you're at is how people will know I'm there. In every office that you're at, if you are my image bearer, people should know I reign and rule. In every school and hospital that you're at, if you are there, you are my image bearer, people should know that I reign and rule. My goodness, justice, and mercy should be expressed, right? People should hear people calling people to live differently, live righteously, live well, and live with justice. There should be compassion and mercy as the underlying economy of our world. Wherever you are, people should know that I reign. Abraham Kuyper, who was a Dutch uh, theologian, newspaper writer, founder of a university, once said at a lecture at the Free University of Amsterdam, there's not one square inch in the whole of human endeavor over which Christ, who is Lord over all, does not cry out, this is mine, this belongs to me. And part of what we do in our work is to advance inch by square inch God's claim that this belongs to him. What would it look like in... Um, as an engineer to say, in this place, God reigns, right? As you work in sales and finance and marketing and education and social services to say, in this place, God reigns. And however I act, I want to announce the coming of the kingdom of God. Not necessarily only by doing evangelism, but by the very means of the work that we do. I want to give us quickly three examples of how people did this in scripture. They aren't the only models, but I think they're uh, illustrative. Because what strikes me when I read the scriptures is they're not filled with full-time religious leaders or workers. There are very few pastors in scriptures. The scriptures are actually filled with workers. And so I want to retell part of the scriptural story to help you see yourselves in it, maybe. So here's model one. This is a guy who was raised in a ranching family. He became an accountant before moving into asset management. He was a victim of false sexual harassment charges and eventually changed occupations, moving into consulting and commodities trading. After a very sec successful stint in the commodities field, he worked for the government by developing the national income tax system, which in that case was a 20% flat tax rate. Who is that? Yeah, Joseph, right? We never think of Joseph in those ways, but when you think about the careers he held, that's what he was doing throughout his time in Scripture. I think his model of a job is, you never hear Joseph talk much about God, but the way he does his job is inherently redemptive, right? The job is predominantly secular, whatever that means, without religious content or impetus, but God uses it to accomplish his kingdom purposes, right? Joseph says to his brothers at the end of Genesis, you, what you intended for evil, God intended for good, and because of your choices, I'm going to save our family. Um, and how are our jobs redemptive? I want to suggest they're easy things, right? If you're in medicine or health, law, right, you're bringing about health. If you're in education, you're developing the minds and the character of the next generation. If you're in law, ultimately, optimally, you're restraining evil. 
former lawyer. Um, if you're a homemaker, you're raising uh, children who flourish, right? In every one of our fields, what we do is inherently meaningful. We have opportunities to live out the social consequences of the gospel, impressing righteousness, justice, concern for the oppressed, and the integrity of our workplaces, testifying to the reality of the world. Um, of God by taking the Sabbath seriously. What that means for some of us, right, it may just mean in your day-to-day -day work, have you found people in your fields to talk about how do we do this in a redemptive, God-honoring way? Not in a religious way, but in a God-honoring way in the work that we do. Maybe what we need in Chicago are more vocational study groups so that marketers can come together and say, um, I have incredible tools to shape the minds, hearts, and souls and aspirations of people, and I have to sell this consumer product. How do I do this in a godly way? How do I help enrich people and, um, but also do it in a way that pleases God? It may be small things. How do you remind yourself that you're God's ambassador to the place? When I was a, a ERISA attorney um, years ago, I used to have on my screensaver um, a, a simple phrase that just reminded me that uh, I was there as God's representative. And I had it coded so that all my friends didn't walk by and go, religious freak, um, as they saw it. But it was a small reminder. Let me give you another example quickly. Um, this guy was an international student. He took placement tests and attended an elite private university before working in information consulting for a number of years. Eventually, he too moved into public service, becoming a governor while battling, battling what really were kind of lethal office politics. At that time, he was appointed to the cabinet and then became chief of staff to the chief of state. Who fits that profile? Yeah, Daniel, right? International student. Maybe interpreting dreams isn't quite information consulting, but it's awfully similar. <laughs> um, what I love about Daniel is you don't learn much about what he did as governor. You don't hear about any great decisions that are particularly ethical. But um, it seems to me that occasionally what our jobs do is they give us a platform to speak, right? Because it, you, several times throughout the scriptures, Daniel walks onto the stage and delivers um, a clear rebuke or correction to the king. Um, he speaks judgment over Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. He testifies to God's salvation um, when he talks to Darius. And as a result, in a number of cases, those kings say, I know your God is the true God. For some of us, our jobs give us a unique platform. And we steward those jobs to give us an opportunity to speak at the right time the right words. And so part of what we need to do in our jobs in those context is how do you pray for eyes to know when to speak? It may be just to a coworker, it may be to the CEO, it may be to an external audience because you have the kind of respect and understanding given your platform, but how do you know when to speak? Let me give you a quickly a third model. Um, it's a woman who is an immigrant, and she with her husband began a construction um, business that was quite successful in multiple cities. On the side, she actually trained theologians and provided job opportunities to Christian workers who were looking for bivocational pastoral opportunities. She traveled throughout the Mediterranean, uh, following Paul from Corinth to Ephesus to Rome. Right? Obviously, Priscilla. Um, sometimes we have jobs because, frankly, we keep them so they give us the resources to actually accomplish what we think of as our real vocation. We hold down a day job so that we can give ourselves to something else. I know numbers of people who said, um, I'm really working in finance because the reason I love to work in finance is I love working with young kids and so I volunteer with Young Life uh, during the evenings and I give away my money generously because I want to empower the mission of God. Um, I know a guy who, um, uh, an incredibly successful commodities trader and he said the main reason I'm trying to earn income is to start new businesses in countries which are otherwise easily close to the gospel, and I'm funding entrepreneurial ventures all around the world. Um, I know a family where they said, uh, God has blessed us with a lot of money, and they actually bought a beach house um, in California in this gorgeous beach area, and I mean, the house is, like, the beach house is both enormous and gloriously beautiful, um, and they say, we actually never live there. Our goal is to allow other people to use it. So Christian ministries throughout the L.A. area use that for retreats. Uh, they offer it to workers who are exhausted. Like, go live on the beach for a week on us, right? They're creating opportunities uh, for other people to flourish. 
Um, I know medical doctors who've said, who banded together, like there was a group of five medical doctors who said, let's reduce our income by 20%, our expectation of income for 20%, so that for 20% of the year, any one of us can go overseas to serve at a missions hospital in a place which needs high quality, high trained, current medical care. Uh, we can't afford to go individually, but if we band together, we could do it together, right? There are ways that people have chosen to shape their jobs to give us the resources they need to pursue their real vocation. Let me end this way. Scripture is filled with the story of other workers. People like Joseph who took secular jobs and did them with excellence to forward kingdom purposes. Um, like there's another guy who was basically a food service manager who moved into urban planning and civil engineering. There are people like Daniel whose excellence gave him a platform to speak in words and actions about the reality of God. For example, um, there was maybe a beauty queen who turned into a trophy wife after perhaps um, being raped, um, who entered the world of international human rights advocacy. There are people like Priscilla, whose occupation gave her the freedom to minister to people more directly. A haute couture designer who clothed poor and taught the scriptures in uh, Asia Minor. Work matters because we're created in God's image, who's a work and he's a worker. Work matters um, because we were created to work. Work matters because it's part of God's blessing for us. There are multiple models of how we might work that scripture gives us. And I want to encourage you, begin to read the scriptures through the eyes of work. It's not just about prayer and scripture and evangelism, though it's all there as well. In part, scripture is designed to guide us in our day-to-day -day activities. And it actually gives us more models than we thought it might have. Let me close this in prayer, and then I'll hand it back over to our MC. Father, I'm grateful for these uh, friends of mine who've gathered to understand how you shape the way that we want to work. Would you help us to glorify you, image you appropriately in the places you've called us, to speak when we're given opportunity, um, and then to delight in the fact that in fact your blessing to us is not one day of rest, but it's the sixth day of labor that precedes that day of rest. May we see you, follow you, and see how you work through us, in us, and in spite of us in those places. Amen.